There we go. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for our Processing the Pandemic event. I'm really excited to be here with all of you and create the space for dialogue, creativity, and personal reflection. So I'm guessing that we're all here because we love comics and you know we're fascinated by them. And perhaps during the pandemic, especially during the worst of the lockdowns, we were also comforted by the comics. I know for me, at least, seeing comics about COVID-19 pop up on my social media feed was really comforting and motivating. It was good to, you know, have a laugh over like shared experiences and shared culture shocks. And some of those comics were even educational, which was kind of nice in terms of like normalizing this new way of life. So that's what inspired us to organize this event. We wanted to create a space where we could talk about comics and the role that they play for us during the pandemic as well as have a space for us to do some internal reflection and stretch our creative muscles through some comic making activities. So throughout today's presentation, we have shared some of our favorite COVID-19 comics with you on the slides, starting with this first one by Dr. Sherlina Bovi herself. And if you have a favorite pandemic uh, comic or perhaps an artist who has been documenting their pandemic experiences through art, please feel free to share that with us in the chat. We would love to check it out. So this event is called Processing the Pandemic, but we also wanna recognize that we're processing so much more. This past year has confronted us with a lot of undeniable atrocities and injustices filled by white supremacy and other forms of, in of institutional inequalities. These have impacted all of us, but especially those of us who identify as BIPOC and from other marginalized identities. So that's why we wanna state as members of the UCR community, we stand with AAPI communities and Black Lives Matters against xenophobia, racism, sexism, and other human rights violations. We also recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kawia, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, as well as their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Though we now meet in digital spaces like this Zoom, we invite you to learn whose ancestral lands you're physically located on by visiting the uh, website native-land.ca. And now I'll pass it on to my colleague, Andrea. Thanks, Andy. Um, so yeah, my name is Andrea Hoff. I'm the university archivist here at UCR. Um, and at this point, we did wanna give everyone a heads up about the content of the presentation. Uh, I think it goes without saying that we're going to be talking about COVID-19. Um, however, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that this is a difficult topic for many people. Um, so just to be clear, the content and discussion in this presentation will focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and the role comics have played in helping people process the trauma that the pandemic has inflicted. This may be emotionally difficult and potentially trigger triggering to some. We recognize that the pandemic isn't over and many people may still be experiencing its effects. If at any time you would like to step away, we will make available a recording of this presentation at a later time. Um, and I found, I just wanted to give credit to uh, this comic artist here named Madeline Slade, um, who came up with this wonderful comic about trigger warnings. Um, and there's a link to her website where uh, she publishes her other comics as well. Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, we're going to briefly go over our agenda for the day. Um, so first I'm gonna just take a moment to talk about special collections and university archives. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll have a presentation by Dr. Shirlene Obwobi. Uh, then we'll take a break for five minutes. Um, and after the break, we'll start uh, the workshop component of uh, the presentation today, which will be read by, led by Rachel Cruz. Um, and then we should have some time um, for questions and the closing. Next slide, please. Um, so this event was organized by Special Collections and University Archives at UC Riverside and um, has been made possible with funding by the Tomas Rivera Endowment at UC Riverside. Um, at Special Collections and University Archives, we're responsible for housing archives and manuscript collections, photographs, books, and other rare or unique research material that document a wide range of subject areas. Okay. Um, so uh, when we do reopen, I just wanted to let everyone know that the reading room um, is located on the fourth floor of the Tomas Rivera Library. Um, so as we transition um, back to campus, 
please feel free to stop by. And then the next slide, please. Um, and I also want to let everyone know about our COVID-19 collecting initiatives. Uh, since it's the mission of the University Archives to document the history of UCR, we are actively seeking donations related to COVID-19 and the impact it's having on the UCR community. So if you have anything you'd like to donate documenting your experience of the pandemic, whether that's photographs, journals, face masks, drawings, please get in touch. Uh, this has been a historic year and we want to make sure we're documenting how it's affected life at UCR. Um, if you'd like more information about this collecting initiative, um, you can find it here. Um, I'll drop a link to the chat, uh, to um, that slide in the chat, and or you can email me directly, um, and my email address is on the screen for you now, and I'll share it again before the end of the presentation. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Shirlene Abuobi. Uh, Dr. Shirlene Abuobi, excuse me. Um, she's a third year internal medicine resident, a rising cardiology fellow, and creator of the comic platform Shirley Whirl MD. Shirley Whirl MD was started in 2016 by then beleaguered third year medical student Shirlene Abuobi. It began as a vehicle of self expression during a time of professional growth, and her comics were initially shared with her medical school classmates before finding their way onto social media. The moniker Shirley Whirl came from one of Shirley's friends, um, nicknames for her. Shirley Whirl MD has been featured in The Lancet, Axios, Doximity.com, Use Chicago Magazine, and more. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shirlene. Thanks so much for that introduction, Andrea. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I do have, um, oh, um, a full presentation for you guys, okay? All right, so um, as Andrea said, um, I'm Shirlene. Um, I'm a current third year uh, internal medicine resident at the University of Chicago. I'm about to be a cardiology fellow um, and I draw comics. Um, so I'm specifically gonna talk about comics and how um, the, I've evolved in my creative process um, during the time of COVID, but I'll start a little bit earlier. So kind of to zoom out, uh, I just wanna talk about what the functions in general of art are. So um, this is from the, the a professor, Lena Baseman. I just found it on the website and I really connected with it. Um, and she said the functions of art are sixfold. Um, it's for delight, uh, for commentary, um, for worship and ritual, uh, com commemoration, persuasion, um, and self-expression. So when I initially started um, Shirley Whirl MD, um, I kind of um, had all of these different things in mind. So comics in particular are a little bit different than typical art, right? Um, because they they use imagery, but they also use words. Um, the imagery is really important because, you know, pictures, as they say, are worth a thousand words. Um, they can have a lot of emotional content. They reference things without necessarily requiring introduction. So um, they have different meanings within different cultural contexts. Um, and different people can bring their own meanings to the table when they're looking at comics. So you don't actually have to use, you don't have to spend a lot of time um, explaining different points. Um, those are, can be expressed by themselves within the images. Uh, but um, you can, with comics, you can actually guide them somewhat. So um, that's why I'm saying I like words to be there um, so that I can, I, you don't have to mince my meaning. I can really say what I, I mean to say um, through comics um, and use the words to guide it with the emotional context kind of covered by the imagery. So together they make for this really awesome way to get really information um, in an information heavy world. And so, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but um, uh, over the course of the last decade or so, my intention span went from being able to handle a five minute YouTube video to like really just needing like <laughs> little cards on Instagram, right? Um, uh, there's just so much information out there that we are trying to find more and more efficient ways to relay it, um, really our meanings and thoughts um, to others. Um, and we don't have as much space and comics are just, incredibly efficient for that. So kind of uh, talking a little bit about Shirley Rural MD um, and how it came to be. 
Um, I'll say that over the last, I guess now four or five years, um, the platform itself has changed and my goals of the platform have changed pretty dramatically. Um, this here is a, an image of a medical student transforming into a resident um, or um, an intern in this particular case. I present my medical students like this. It's a little bit tongue in cheek because um, they're babies. <laughs> and I was once a baby, so it makes sense. Um, so when I was a third year medical student, uh, the things that I talked about really were my third year experiences, right? Um, so in your third year of medical school, you're finally released onto um, your clinical rotations. Um, so, and, and just remind me, most of you are undergrads, correct? Is that right, Andrea? I mean, I guess, yes. Um, so- Yeah, um, so we have a mix so far, but definitely some undergrad representation. Awesome. Um, so uh, as a third year medical student, um, that's the first time you're really on the wards. Um, so you actually get to enter the hospital. Before that, you're really mostly in the classroom. And I know the, those of you who are um, unfortunately medical students during the pandemic, your first two years have probably been spent um, sitting behind a computer on Zoom. Um, and it makes for a very different experience when you're finally interacting with patients, but you're also interacting very directly with the medical hierarchy. Um, and so that was a, what a lot of my comics back in my third year of medical school were about. Um, so in this one, for example, um, it's this experience of seeing one of your friends rounding with a different team on the hospital floors. And, you know, because of how the hierarchy is set up, you can't really just run off and go say hi to them. You can't hold back your team. So instead you make this really intense eye contact and you try to communicate as much with your face about how excited you are to see that person um, while still kind of drifting apart because you have to stay with your team. And I kind of stuck with that. Like I was really excited to talk about things like, oh, um, getting out of the hospital quickly because as a third year, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of your residents uh, for how long you stay. Um, and so um, this is I, when I would get released within eight hours, I'd be super happy. Or even things as simple as, you know, getting a paper cut. Um, back when I used to carry notes, I haven't carried them in a long time. Um, and getting a paper cut and having to clean my hands in between patients, right? So those are the kind of the things I used it for initially, really was just mo mostly for the delight standpoint, also for the self-expression really, right? Like, because I was finding this, uh, I, I used these comics as a way to really process all of this new information I was getting, these new experiences I was having. Um, as I progressed um, into residency, um, some of this changed a little bit, the topics changed as my, um, the requirements of my profession changed, right? Um, so as a resident, um, you, you get that MD, you got the MD now, that part's done, um, or the DO or whichever degree you have as a physician. Um, and you go into the hospital, now you are working, right? Um, which is sometimes kind of funny. I, um, for those who aren't necessarily acquainted with the healthcare field, um, medical school student and resident, the two rules can seem um, very similar, but they're, they're pretty different. As a medical student, maybe you carry two, three patients. Um, your focus is really on the presentation. Um, as a resident, you're, like, you know, your, your hours are much longer. Um, the responsibilities are, um, are expanded pretty dramatically. Um, and for example, in this one, um, this is a, a comic about um, a 28 hour call. So after um, I, I do 28 hour calls, um, depending on the rotation every three to four days. And um, you, so you basically, you come there at 7 a.m. one day and you leave at 10 a.m. the next, but um, you round with your attendings at, in the morning after you've been there all day and all night. And the joke here, with, of course, is that, you know, sometimes attendings will want to teach during rounds. Um, and that takes time and takes time away from you in your bed. And so I would, I would make jokes about things like that. Um, or about documentation, right? As a medical student, you know, you write a few notes. Um, as a resident, you start um, having to really um, you write your notes for all of your, your patients, you fill out code inquiries, um, you like do paperwork, and that can often take um, a significant amount of time. Um, and I, I wrote 30% in this one, but someone, I was corrected several times by some of my colleagues that actually it's like this 70, 80. Um, and of course, there was this, the, other, the other aspect of it, right, is that um, you suddenly have to um, deal with these very emotionally intense um, situations, right? And those situations, when you're in them as a resident, sometimes you don't have the time, or I would say most times you don't really have the time to process them in the moment because you have other patients that take care of and other responsibilities. Um, and so um, I would draw about those, that how I was processing those information, those um, emotions as well, which meant that a lot of times if I, I mean, I, I process in my comics, but um, a lot of times they would leak out in other areas of my life, right? 
Um, so kind of on the same topic, um, I, I, I did a lot of compare, contract, comparing and contrasting between um, my way of handling different situations as a medical student and then later as a resident. So here I show an example of the very first time actually that I saw somebody um, die after a code. Um, and I remember looking around the room and seeing that, you know, almost everybody I was there with was um, very, you know, like was jovial um, and um, was well, cracking jokes, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I was, I was like stunned and flabbergasted. I was like, whoa, this person just died. I actually, like, I remember my very first thought was this weird, it was very strange out of nowhere. I was like, oh my gosh, if we were in the Harry Potter world, I would be able to see Thestrals now, right? <laughs> like that was the first thing that kind of came to mind. Um, and how after I became a resident, I had to run codes. I had to be um, who the blonde um, resident is in the first uh, panel. Um, I, I, I got used to it and it kind of goes to show uh, what you can really get used to um, when you are admired in these situations all the time. So um, kind of going on, um, I think that as, as I, I progress, you know, a lot of these are like for self-expression, for reflection, as I've kind of discussed already, um, kind of the, the, um, the way my comics were crafted um, were really initially um, just for me. And even before um, I started sharing them, I, uh, I mostly kept them to myself. I actually just showed them to one of my friends um, who encouraged me to set, share it with my class, who then encouraged me to share it with uh, the, the wider social media world. Um, and so, uh, but then as time went on, um, some of this, this shifted a little bit as my, my experiences became, um, and the things I was seeing, um, became less about me and more about systems. And so um, a lot of the comics started becoming more commentary. This started fairly early actually. Like um, one of the observations I had made when I was a medical student was that I would introduce myself um, to um, suit patients um, as the medical student. And it would be a really hard time for them to like wrap their minds around um, that meaning that I was going to be a doctor. Um, and there's nothing wrong, for example, um, and like uh, careers like being a nurse or physician's assistant or social worker, those are all in, like incredible roles. They do um, some things, things I could not do, right? <laughs> um, but um, of course, I'm, a medical student is not training to be a nurse, but that would be, um, and honestly still is like a, a thing that is difficult sometimes for people to see because the image of a physician isn't necessarily someone who looks like me. It's someone who looks like House or Leonardo DiCaprio and Catch Me If You Can. It's like usually like a tall white dude, right? Um, it's shifting, but um, in a lot of patients' minds, it still wouldn't fit. And so I kept running into this um, issue all the time where my role on the team would be almost unclear no matter how often I explained it. Um, and that, uh, when I first dropped this comic, I remember that this was one of the first ones where um, people really responded in the sense of, oh my gosh, I thought this was just me. Um, or this happens to me all the time, or I've been practicing for 20 years and this is still the case, right? Um, and so um, I found um, that uh, a lot of my comics started shifting a little bit more into the era of commentary after that. Um, and this commentary often is personal. And I actually, um, most of the comics that I draw, draw from personal experiences. Um, I do this for a number of reasons. One of them is that I think that um, sometimes the topics that are covered in my comics can be deemed quote unquote controversial, right? Um, but what is not controversial are my own stories, right? Like my personal experiences cannot be deemed, like there's no opinions about that. There's these things that happen. Um, and so uh, uh, this is something um, that I remember was a very frustrating experience for me um, earlier in my residency uh, um, when I, there was a patient who um, was decompensating, getting sicker, and I came in and I knew what was going on um, and I knew what to, how to correct it. And I communicated that to the nurse and she basically refused to carry out my orders. Um, I explained them because of course we're a team, we're supposed to be on the same side, trying to help the patient. Um, and she still didn't uh, accept my explanation. Um, and so in this particular case, I just went and found um, one of my colleagues um, who was a white man. And I was like, hey, friend, <laughs> I need you to do something kind of weird for me. And I just updated him on who the patient was, what was going on, um, and what my plan was. I made sure that um, he agreed that my plan was appropriate. And I just brought him into the room with me and was like, and he just said exactly what I had said 
like three minutes before and everything got done. Patient got taken care of, right? But it was one of those situations where it kind of reminded me kind of what, um, how powerful um, biases can really like play into care even when you're coming from the uh, physician clinician side. So um, kind of one of the things that happens, of course, when you put your work out there um, is that initially when I started, kind of as I said, it was more for self-reflection. Um, so I was trying to process my own very complicated emotions, feelings, thoughts, um, and in a way that I felt was what productive for me. Um, but then of course, once you start looking inwards, um, the, uh, once you put it out there, you start also looking outwards and other people start giving you feedback. And so I was getting windows into other people's experiences as well. And that was what would, ha would happen often, right? So I would get commentary that, oh, no, like, oh my goodness, this, this is what I've had experienced as well. Um, or I think equally, or sometimes even more valuable is that I it would create, um, really great tangents. Like one of the, my favorite things about drawing comics is the commentary that comes afterwards, the discourse. Um, and so someone might not have my exact experience, um, but uh, maybe they have something that's related and they share it and that like spi spirals and people continue having conversations. I think that's especially important in healthcare because I feel as though um, many parts of healthcare are kind of obscured from to the outside world we don't really talk about what happens in the hospital. And I mean, until very recently, I feel like, um, especially on the doctor side, it was considered this very buttoned up career um, and professionalism and being professional meant really being stoic um, and not really showing human size of yourself and being very matter of fact, et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, and um, of course that is changing now, but um, being able to express oneself in this, in this way is kind of a new thing in our field. One thing I'm very intentional about um, is, um, is about myself and my depiction of myself. Um, I chose to make uh, my avatar for Shirley Royal MD um, a depiction of me. And, you know, she doesn't necessarily like straight up look like me. Um, I think I'm actually, I have a hard time drawing myself actually, but um, uh, the, but she has features that I think like, like hearken to um, who, what many aspects of my identity, for example, um, I have locks um, and my character has hair that's shaped to look like locks. Um, I, I give her my dark skin when I, when she's colored in and my full lips, I give her scrubs and a white coat so that's really apparent what her profession is. Um, even though when I'm in the hospital, to be honest, I usually don't dress like this. Um, I look a lot sloppier. <laughs> um, and some of that is, of course, uh, and I mean, I think that's, that, that has been important. I remember one of the first times um, that someone requested to put me in print, they actually asked whether they could lighten the skin tone of the character. And of course, I understood that they were trying to say that, oh, it might be easier to print, right? But like, um, my skin tone is very dark um, most of the time in, in, in real life, right? And I, I, I'm very married to that particular particular depiction of myself. Um, and, you know, aside from like the, the very obvious of in, in, um, ways to draw yourself, I, I draw myself looking as I, I, as I do. Um, I found that um, people can depict themselves in very different ways. This is actually from a workshop I did um, with some students um, from uh, Glasgow, from University of Glasgow, where I asked them to draw um, a version of themselves um, that, as they saw themselves in their future careers. And these are both people who said they wanted to be pediatricians, right? And they, I have a whole magical girl series, like a medical magical girl series on my Instagram um, where I draw different specialties as magical girls and I give them stats, et cetera. Um, and so I add them, do add that aspect of it. And the difference in the way they depicted a pediatrician or if you should be pediatrician was like very stark, right? We have uh, our friend on the left um, who chose their stats to be things like babel fluency and um, desire to procreate, which was none when you're a pediatrician, um, and, but an immense respect for parents, but also um, drew themselves as a clown because they're like, oh my goodness, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I choosing this career? Um, and uh, exposing myself to from some truly sad cases, right? Um, and um, exposing myself also to like a, not a great work-life balance, which 
um, unfortunately is still a problem in a lot, large number of healthcare careers versus the person on the right who um, their version of a pediatrician was um, a lot brighter um, and a bouncier and almost like a fairy and they called themselves a pink pediatrician um, and they gave themselves um, high stats in the adaptability, stamina, charisma areas because they felt that having to work with children in a general um, practitioner sense is requires one to be very flexible, adaptable, and friendly. And so um, the different ways one kind of can use the visuals in uh, comics or in, um, in, in this, these styles to really express identity is really fun. So kind of going back to the commentary aspect. Um, so as I said, a lot of the comics initially were really about um, inwards, uh, looking inwards, right? But very quickly they became a, more about um, looking outwards, right? And so in this particular um, place um, uh, or in this particular comic, the what I'm, I'm mostly talking about is health insurance. Um, uh, one thing I, I kind of knew going into this field is that American healthcare um, is really convoluted. There's a lot of, um, of course, um, lack of coverage for people, but I didn't realize quite how bad it was until I uh, became a part of this profession. Um, and so um, I'm gonna go through this comic a little bit cl more closely than the others. Um, from the visual aspect, I decided to depict insurance companies as a snake. <laughs> and this is a kind of a twofold, I have twofold reasonings. Of course, there's the part that's being like snarky and tongue in cheek, that's calling them snakish. Um, and then there's the other aspect, which is that private healthcare, um, if you buy your own healthcare coverage, it's frequently called COBRA. So this is coverage COBRA, right? Um, and um, coverage COBRA impedes my work every day. <laughs> so um, very frequently what would happen is that we would bring in patients um, who needed procedures in order to, to um, prevent something that had just happened that had led them to be inpatient from having to be admitted again and their insurance would not cover it or their insurance would cover it only um, at an outside hospital, which was really inaccessible for the patient um, and um, which would put them in a place where they would almost certainly have a recurrence, right? Um, I'm thinking about um, a patient, for example, this is a long time ago, who had like a massive uterus that was blocking off their ureters and we were able to put a stent in and um, relieve the stress on her kidneys, right? But the main thing was the uterus had to come out, but her insurance wouldn't cover um, the hysterectomy here and the next the next time she could get it elsewhere was like in six months. So we're like, okay, I guess we're gonna see you in three weeks <laughs> when, when your, your kidneys go down again, right? Um, and uh, trying to order medications for patients um, and having to, uh, after you've ordered it, fill out what's called a prior authorization, which is really just a, a very long, complicated process where you tell the insurance company all the reasons why you ordered the medication, which, you know, you ordered it, so you had reasons for it, right? Um, or this fact that, you know, I'm going into cardiology and cardiology is a highly evidence-based field. We try our best um, in that field to really um, make sure that everything that we're doing um, is based on studies. Um, a lot of the times you'll see when, when we're uh, when cardiology rounds, uh, we're supposed to just name drop studies left and right, right? And we can name drop all of these studies, but a lot of times uh, when it comes to applying um, the results of those studies to our patients, we get held up. So um, the medications that we know are best for certain scenarios might not be covered. Um, in which case, I mean, kind of what's the point of all these, the doing all these studies and knowing all the, knowing best practice if you can't actually provide what you know is the best care for your patients. Um, and then the last aspect of it, which is, uh, this just barely touches on this aspect, right, which is that I'm getting medical care for myself um, and for for um, healthcare providers for themselves, even though we provide this care, we still don't necessarily great, get great access. And I always joke that residency is what made me need to go to therapy, right? And I can't get a therapist like, who covered in the, in my residency healthcare, right? Um, and so um, it's it's this thing that um, I, I like frequently comment on in my comics because I think it has probably one of the biggest impacts on my ability to provide the care that I wanted to um, that I came into medicine wanting to provide. Um, and so the final um, reason why I find myself often um, drawing my comics is for the art of persuasion, right? So um, this kind of ties in a little bit to commentary, right? Um, because when you comment on something, you're trying to really bring about, about a point. You're trying to make people think about something. Um, but persuasion really uh, calls for calls to action um, and asks people to actually make a move. And so, for example, 
um, uh, in this particular, um, and I know this is, a, is about resilience during the pandemic, but you guys are gonna get a good idea of what, how I feel about the concept of resilience in healthcare. Um, and um, in, in residency, um, you know, we joke that we're kind of indentured servants, right? To the hospital we come um, and we, we generate a fair amount of income. We're training physicians. We need to have attending um, approval over us, um, but really like the hours are quite string, like the, the hours are long. There's not as much time um, to, to take care of yourself. And I mean, um, it's very, it's pretty typical for me. I think I would say my average hours a week are probably around 60 and the bad, the, my worst weeks have been a hundred and my worst, my, my best are around a 40 hour week. Right. And so um, a lot of times, you know, we um, like there's a lot of discussion about taking how do you take your care of yourself when you're working hours like that. Um, and medical education's answer to that has really been to, to teach us um, resilience. Right. Um, to be like, oh, well, you know, um, if you were more disciplined or you were able to garner your own resilience, maybe you would be able to take care of yourself. Right. Um, and I mean, I push back pretty heavily against that. And um, my goal um, for people who are um, um, uh, following my comics is to really also consider pushing back against that concept and really to ask for more system systemic change, right? Like to, to say that, like, you know, we're still um, working humans and adults and we, we need benefits, right? <laughs> um, and we need, like, we need vacation time and the ability to, like, cook for ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I frequently also talk about systemic racism and bias and healthcare disparities. Um, I recently published a paper uh, about this particu in particular um, in The Lancet. And um, one of the things I talk about frequently is that in medical education, um, when we do talk about healthcare disparities, we frequently will say that an ethnic group, which is frequently African-Americans, have um, lower or worse outcomes um, in pretty much everything. Like if you're, if you ever sit in a, if you're, as a med student, you sit in a medical student school class, um, they'll introduce a disease. And most of the time, if, unless it's like cystic fibrosis or spherocytosis, they'll be like um, more prevalent in black communities and um, also in popular black populations and also deadlier in black populations, right? Without really like that much of a background or really going into why that happens, right? Um, I think in, and I think that does a disservice for a lot of reasons. Um, I think that first of all, it ignores the fact that, you know, in America, at least what defines a black person is very broad. Um, I am um, ethnically, I'm from Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian American, right? Um, and one of my best friends, um, her name's Deja. She is African-American. She's very light skinned compared to me. And in the United States, we were like both black. And when we actually, when we travel elsewhere, that can change, um, which shows just how fluid and, um, really subjective race kind of is, right? Because in Turkey, uh, I tried to say that I was a Black American and they were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> They're like, Deja is, you are not. <laughs> um, and so um, the, yes, but like, it, it's such a fluid thing. And so not really taking, so trying to just choke, chalk it up to race, which is not a scientific variable, ignores the the sociological context, right? Um, ignores racism and the legacy of slavery and re like stress that just comes from um, living in America as a min marginalized, uh, minoritized person, right? Um, and that, um, a lot of the research in healthcare has really gone into trying to figure out what exactly is wrong with Black bodies that causes them to have, say, um, higher rates of kidney disease without actually being honestly responsible and reflecting on, okay, like what is it, is it about the American context? Um, and this has consequences, right? I mean, they did a study, um, not to, I'm not trying to remember what the, the uh, where it was, it's in my article somewhere, um, where they asked medical students questions like, um, do you think, is it true or false that black people experience um, less pain, right? And an alarming number of people said yes. And that's not because necessarily that those students came in um, hard thinking that, oh, Black people require less pain medications. It's probably because they just see over and over and over again this narrative that's not given any context um, about, um, about like Black people bodies being different, back bodies being inherently broken. And so I push back a lot on that um, in a lot of my, my comics, right? Um, because I think that um, you know, and we can't have health without thinking about the larger context, about, about thinking about um, um, the whys, right? So um, that that is one of the things that I, I use a lot to talk about persuade, to use uh, um, 
when I'm trying to persuade people to really consider other aspects when they're teaching. Um, I also use, uh, I switch over a little bit, um, depending on what I'm, I'm really talking about there. My typical Shirley World comics are like the ones I've shown you before. They're brightly colored. They have four panels uh, or one to four panels. And they're meant to be like a little bit snarky. Like you're not, I'm not going for a full belly laugh. I, I don't I don't know whether my humor is capable of that, um, but I'm usually going for like a <laughs> when people um, uh, uh, engage with my work, right? Um, and, but but sometimes I think I, I'm not in the space where I, um, or the, the thing I want to talk about is, to, is serious, right? Um, and doesn't really inspire laughter. And I, I use, uh, and this kind of goes back to the beginning when I was talking about the, the power of images, right? Like that images um, and um, have, like are worth a thousand words, right? Um, because just by playing with color and playing a little bit with style, I can shift a mood and I can tell the people who are reading that, hey, like, this is no longer something that is going to be like a light fluffy thing that you laugh at and scroll past, right? This is now I'm, I'm kind of getting serious. I'm trying to tell a longer narrative. I also play a lot with panels um, in this. So like the image and the visual aspects of this aren't just limited to um, the actual, the context. It's it's to what, um, how things are arranged, right? So for, for example, in this particular page um, of, of one of the comics I drew, um, this was in, I believe, June 2020. We were in the middle of the pandemic and I was working in a COVID ICU and there were protests in the streets because I think George Floyd had just been murdered. Um, and, you know, we were, I was tired. We were all tired um, of kind of this, um, this like, like there was this widespread like trauma that I think a lot of us were experiencing. And I drew about a particular experience I had in my childhood where um, my family was escorted out of a hotel um, uh, by police um, because me and my siblings were being kids, you know, um, and um, how that every time a black person gets shot, um, and, um, especially like in the streets, extrajudicial, extra like murder, extrajudicial, excuse me. <laughs> um, um, it makes me think about my family, right? And how, you know, they're not safe, right? Um, and nothing that they can do, um, and no matter how respectable they are, um, that they are always kind of at this, like this, the risk of being murdered. Right, um, and I used, um, I kind of showed this, uh, used this set, setup to um, show how that, that connection between different members of my family and different victims of police violence. So now finally, <laughs> I'll actually talk about COVID. So um, I worked in the COVID ICU um, back last year. My hospital initially split, uh, separated COVID patients from everybody else. Um, and so we created specific teams um, to, to uh, take care of COVID patients. Um, we basically quarantined them onto different floors. Um, and those of us who worked there went through a very, had a very um, uh, strict um, set of kind of guidelines to prevent spread of the disease. So for example, um, we came in, um, uh, we, I, I, would, uh, I would have a different set of scrubs that I would change into before I went to the unit. I had um, PPE, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this lasted for about three months before we decided to decohort, um, which meant that um, instead of separating the COVID patients, they were kind of mixed in um, uh, for better or for worse with everybody else. Um, but it was a very, um, I think, uh, the height of the pandemic was a very emotional and terrifying time um, for healthcare workers. Now, as I said, I'm not a big fan of resilience, right? Like um, I'm a, here, I represent resilience as a pile of poo, right? <laughs> um, which is not very, it's, it's, it's not very um, elegant, I know. Um, but in general, um, how I I basically felt about it was that you know it ignores the systems, like just talking about just resilience without looking at the systemic reasons why um, we, people may be struggling um, was, was not helpful. But then it, COVID came up and all of our systems kind of fell apart, right? So um, the typical, like uh, our typical approach to things almost didn't apply anymore, right? And we were learning new things every single day. Um, we were really battling 
a disease we knew nothing about. Guidelines changed every week. Like I would change, we would do drastically different things every week. So at first it was like steroids are bad, right? Like steroids are, are terrible. You're going to kill your COVID patients if you give them steroids. And now we give everybody um, Decadron, which is a steroid, right? <laughs> um, because studies have come out since um, showing that actually they're beneficial. Um, and that was kind of how things were going. I know you guys probably if, uh, um, heard all about Plaquenil um, um, and how maybe that was good. And then studies came out later showing um, that actually like people had worse outcomes when they took it, right? Um, and so the, we were in a no man's land, which meant that um, my, and, and many of us, our need for self-expression turned into a need also for self-soothing, right? Um, and so uh, those two became kind of something that was joined, they were joined hand in hand um, with each other. So um, it wasn't just me. Uh, there were several comic artists who were also healthcare workers and also people who were not healthcare workers. Um, I, I'm not highlighting them in this, but I do want to acknowledge that there was a huge outpouring of art um, and so many comics that came out um, by people who were in quarantine um, and who uh, people who had lost family members um, due to COVID or who had to change um, and around major events in their lives. Um, but um, spoke, focusing more on um, the healthcare workers, this became like an international thing that we were all doing, which was drawing comics about our experiences. So this is about, about Dr. Lalanda. She is a, um, she's a physician actually in Spain um, and who uh, before COVID really hit the US, it hit Europe, right? It really, it hit Spain. I think it hit Italy really hard. We saw all of those horrible images of um, people like rationing ventilators, um, hanging up, running out of PPE, like in trash bags, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here um, she kind of depicts um, this naked physician trying to take down this massive virus with a slingshot while standing on the bodies of her call or of his, of their colleagues, right? Um, and that really was what COVID felt like in the beginning. Um, it was not just the um, the that aspect of it. There was also an aspect of it of, of COVID comics that were used for education. So on the right um, is a comic created by Dr. Lalanda um, to show um, case what the symptoms of COVID were, um, and and she color coded them too to say, okay, these are really frequent, like they're really common. Um, symptoms and here these are the symptoms that are a little bit less common so that she could spread this out information out to patients um which i i like this is an aside i love comics as a way to reach um uh, like patients and to reach not people who aren't in healthcare because i think they're just so accessible there's like i said there's just so much less that you have to explain because pictures take care of a bulk of it um, there's also um, other comics where people who weren't necessarily engaged directly with the um, patients during the pandemic, right? So for example, uh, Dr. Williams, who we kind of think of as the father of graphic medicine, he's the one who coined the term. Um, he's a, a general practitioner or primary care doctor in the UK. And he talks a lot about how, you know, during COVID, a lot of people would tell him, would, would call him and tell him, oh my goodness, this must be so hard for you, et cetera. But he said, actually, like things slowed down significantly for him because he was a physician who was in a clinic and clinics were closed, right? Um, so most of what he was doing was um, either telephone visits or video visits, which really people weren't super crazy about those in the very beginning. We were kind of experimenting with that idea. And so everybody's schedules in clinic were very light. Um, and so, um, um, the uncertainty he felt was kind of shared by his patients, right? Like he didn't know much of what was going on because he wasn't in the hospitals and he, neither did the patients. And so often he would, or they would almost empathize with each other. And I, I found that to be really powerful, really powerful form of that narrative as well. Um, I was one of the people, of course, who was like there. So <laughs> um, one of the things that I, I really processed while um, I was in uh, kind of working in the pandemic was, were a couple things. I mean, it was the concept of, um, of healthcare workers as heroes, right? And as, as almost being martyrs, right? Um, and really processing, okay, why did I become a doctor? Right, because there's a, there was a narrative that was kind of going around that was like, okay, you signed up for this, right? Um, and um, the question was, the, the, the reality was a lot of us, like we didn't sign up for a pandemic. <laughs> um, and um, we were still, those of us who were residents were still trainees, right? So we're, we're being conscripted almost into this army of healthcare workers fighting against a pandemic while not really getting, um, like we're not people who are getting 
we're not getting paid for it. We're not getting have it paid. We're not getting really much of anything, right? Like we're, we have debt. <laughs> um, and so that was like a very complicated feeling while also feeling really strongly that, you know, I am able to help people in this very um, visceral way in these really uncertain times and kind of what that, that means, right? But I was scared in the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of us were scared. We didn't know what we were getting into. People were getting sick left and right. Young people were on ventilators. It just didn't really make sense. Um, what was going on. And that uncertainty kind of permeated. Um, my, my colleagues would, some of them would, would um, rent out rooms in hotels so they would be away from their families because of that fear of, of bringing the virus home who didn't know exactly like um, how it was spreading in the very beginning, you know. Um, and kind of going back to this idea of this healthcare workers, heroes, you know, um, and how kind of, like, and I, I think this is now, um, it's, it's not just healthcare workers, it's also essential workers, right? Um, and one thing I think that is amazing that's happening right now is that people are starting to realize that, you know, like we're, if we're essential um, to make people's lives easier, really we should be compensated for that, right? Um, and for me, um, and for many of us, the concept of being uh, a hero felt dehumanizing in a lot of ways because a hero is meant to sacrifice themselves, right? Like, um, and to and meant to do that thanklessly, right? Like, if you are a hero and you, um, then you don't, you, you're the one who runs into the burning building, right? Um, and so um, the the idea of being called that and really getting the platitudes wasn't satisfying for many of us. Um, and there, there was also this really big sensation uh, or feeling that, you know, um, we are out here putting our necks on the line and the best thing that everyone else can do to protect us is to quarantine, wear masks, you know, and now that the vaccine is out, get vaccines and that's how you really like, uh, or get vaccinated. And that's really how you, you show um, regard for healthcare workers. And that wasn't really happening either. So there's this weird thing where it's like, like a lot of us were, were cracking jokes, uh, appropriate or not, that we're saying that, you know, if you don't wear a mask, you should be, you should sign us a, a form that says you don't want to be intubated, right? Because intubation, which it requires, you know, you, you get the tube put down and get hooked up to a ventilator to help you breathe, is what you call an aerosolizing procedure, which means it releases, um, like you, you release COVID everywhere, right? Um, you release COVID everywhere. Um, you're putting the people who are doing the procedure and who are in the room taking care of you at risk, right? So we're saying, if you're not willing to put on a mask, you should not make us intubate you. Um, a joke, of course, we'll take care of everyone. That's part of the oath, right? But it was a, a sensation that we were kind of all having. Um, and then there were the more humorous reflections during COVID. Um, for example, um, that um, uh, masks, I don't think I'm gonna give up my mask because my face like cannot, I don't have any control over it. Um, and so, but that was one of the great things is that like people would come talking at me crazy and I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't, wouldn't have to regulate my facial expression because <laughs> I could do whatever I wanted behind the mask. The eyebrows are still, you know, so they're still active, but um, it was, there were still times where it was, it was fun to really like draw humor from it. Um, kind of going into this, I talked a little bit more about this, but like uh, we had the first, uh, we had a first wave that was horrible and that was kind of in spring 2020 and then things quieted down in the summer um, when everybody was it got warm enough in Chicago which is where I am um, for people to really start going outside um, and you know we I would I would drive out and see people like at barbecues and be really terrified that the numbers were going to go up but they didn't um, but um, kind of around the time that things got better um, a lot of us had the, the chance to really process again, right? Because um, we had some space away from the COVID ICU. And, you know, to really sit and think about what it was that we had borne witness to, right? Um, and um, for me, drawing about COVID was really a way to bear witness and let people know what was going on inside um, of the COVID ICU, which was a, by definition, locked off place, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that I had found most difficult to deal with was just the loss of quality of life years, right? Like looking at somebody and saying, thinking that, wow, you would have lived another 30 years if this pandemic hadn't happened. Like there was no reason for you to die, right? Um, and that like multiplied that by 20s, 30s, et cetera. Like I saw a lot of people die in ways that were confusing to me, right? Because like I said um, in, earlier, in my earlier comics where I was talking about code statuses and like kind of the emotional um, upheaval of residency and dealing with people in, in life and death situations, um, you get used to it um, in a lot of ways when you're in these professions. 
but the way you get used to it is a little bit different. Like I, I am, I handle expected deaths quite well. And that sounds, and you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's a coping mechanism for a lot of us because you can't carry the weight of everybody's um, demises on your shoulders. You won't be able to function. Um, but um, it's also um, a, a function of just being getting getting used to kind of predicting what a course was going to look like. But COVID was the opposite. Like COVID, I had no idea what to expect. Right? Someone, I would tell someone. I remember in the beginning of pandemics, I would tell someone that they were going to be fine. Well, okay, we would get them through this, and then two days later, they would be dead. Right. Um, and so there was this thing that I would, and I, I still kind of process that even to this day. I, I, there are certain patients in particular that I think about, right? Because I think about, man, like you should not, you should still be here. Right. Um, and so that would hang heavy um, often after after the worst of um, worst of the, the cases had kind of come by, after our numbers had come down, like having to sit and really think about what had just happened and what we had allowed almost as a, a, a country and as the world to happen um, was was um, what drove a lot of my later comics in this topic. Um, and then the other, of course, is the other aspect of it, which is that, you know, um, because of COVID, we had to be far away from our families. Um, we had to miss events. There were weddings. My I, my wedding got canceled. <laughs> uh, we're, we're still getting married, isn't it? <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, they're, they're like weddings are canceled and um, Thanksgiving dinners, Christmases, etc. right? Like we had to find this new normal. Um, and you know, we've been sitting in this new normal now for what, a year and a half, almost two years. It's a really long time um, to even be doing, for example, an event like this that we're doing over Zoom. I mean, two years ago, like that wouldn't be how you we were doing it, right? Um, and so um, um, there was there were so many times that I, I, I felt this very dear, like closely. Um, I, as a, in, in residency, you don't get all the holidays anyway, but this was the year I was supposed to have them. Um, and um, it was, uh, you know, I was looking forward to, Christmas um, and New Year's with my family and it, it didn't happen and it made it, it was de it was definitely like um, a thing that I, I mourned um, and drew about in here. I'm kind of talking a little bit more about um, the visual change. I did also draw a comic that was uh, used that used that same long form that I talked about um, when I was talking about uh, my comic about police brutality. Um, so this is just these are just two pages that are from um, that um, particular comic. Um, and um, in this, in these two uh, panels, the things I, I, I wanted to really highlight um, were that the PPE, uh, as I said, I usually draw my more serious comics in a different style. The style is like a little bit more realistic than my typical like kind of bouncy, happy, cartoony style. Um, and I take, I, I usually have it in black and white so you know that it's supposed to be somber. Um, but I um, intentionally for this comic made the PPE, um, highlighted the colors of the PPE. So I, I made, for example, my bonnets were blue and these are all like the true colors of um, the PPE that I was wearing, right? Um, I actually, my, I, I, I don't think I included this panel in here, but um, this respirator mask was something that my fiance bought um, uh, a year ago. He like bought it so he could paint a dry wall, eraser wall, right? And um, they were supposed to provide them for everybody who was in the COVID IC, but we ran out. And so when it was time for me to come in, I brought my own respirator. Um, and so that was kind of the, the, the setup. And as I kind of said, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the thing that was difficult to deal with in this, in, during, the COVID, during COVID was this feeling that it didn't have to happen, right? That, you know, that our lives didn't actually really matter, like that we were disposable, um, that um, I would hear things about, oh, like, well, it only affects old people as though the old people's lives didn't matter, right? Like, you know, um, and so uh, that was part of what drove me to draw this more long form comic that was like, really like, you know, I've been cracking jokes about this, but actually it's serious. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and, and like I said, I, I really wanted to bear witness um, because the COVID ICU was such a closed off space. Um, there wasn't really um, a, a way for the public to see what it looked like on the inside. Um, and there are some people, there are various ways of kind of getting around that. There was actually a nurse um, in my, um, one of the ICU nurses who was working in my unit, who was a photographer and she brought her camera in and she took pictures 
of what was going on because she said there's no other way people are going to see what this looks like. And for me, I mean, I can't, I can't um, take pictures. I'm not a great photographer, but I am a pretty dang good artist. So um, instead, uh, I chose to depict this um, by drawing like the realities of what this looked like, right? Um, and so on the on the image on the left or the page on the left, um, I drew what it was like talking to patients' families, right? Patients' families could not be there, and that was so horrible, right? Because um, they were their loved ones were dealing with this disease that nobody knew anything about. Um, and a lot of them were really struggling and they could not be there to hold their loved one's hands. Um, they couldn't be there when they died, right? They couldn't talk to them. And what it meant was that we would find, we like had a bunch of iPads that we would just hold up <laughs> and give them the chance to really like talk to their, their family members that way, right? Um, it was also strange because, you know, they couldn't even see our faces a lot of the times because we would be wearing PPE. Um, and that was, um, uh, um, if you followed kind of what healthcare workers were doing during the pandemic, a lot of them would, would get ID badges that had their face with a smile because the people who were like our long haulers who were there for a long time just would not see a human face, you know, for weeks and weeks, you know. So um, in the left, I really wanted to show just what it looked like there, like the, how much instrumentation it was requiring for, pe for people. On the right, I, I wanted to show the various um, ways that we delivered um, oxygen at that time. Um, my, my institution um, brought out the helmets um, because we found that actually intubate, when you intub once you put the vent, uh, the tube and you hook them up to the vent, once you intubate them, um, patients' mortality rates like skyrocketed, right? So we were doing everything in our power to avoid doing that. Um, but sometimes we couldn't help it. Um, so we would do, I, I have two of my patients here um, who um, have high flow nasal cannula on, right? Um, I have the helmet on, there were, there's two, in, those, there's a patient here who's intubated, right? Um, and trying to sh kind of showing what, how people were reacting really um, to this horrible illness, the loneliness they felt, right? Um, the, 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 the concerns for their families. Like these are all like actual, I mean, I, change, I always change around um, the, um, the appearance of my patients to try to protect them. Um, but uh, so these aren't the, the patients are the what they're saying is real, right? But what they look like isn't anything like this. But yeah, I had a patient who we were about to intubate him and he like until the very last second wouldn't give us his wife's phone number because he didn't want her to worry. And he ended up passing away um, eventually. And I remember that like we only got, he only, we only got it, out of, got it out of him at the very last second. And how horrible that would have been if, you know, we had, she had no idea. She thought he was doing fine. He'd have called her and been like, I'm doing great. <laughs> um, you know, how horrible that would have been if um, she had to find out when she had to come and identify him, right? Like it was, it was just this incredibly complex period that I really wanted people to see what it was like so that they could understand why it was so important to really try to protect ourselves. Um, so kind of going into the optimism aspect of things. So I drew this comic after I was vaccinated, after vaccines started to roll out. And um, when hope started to kind of settle in that, you know, maybe we will get to the end of this. And I mean, I'm still, I still have some hope. I mean, I'm not, um, I think I'm not as optimistic as the CDC. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be keep wearing my mask probably for a little while longer. Um, but, and that's actually what this comic is about, which came out way before <laughs> that mandate came out, which is that I'm never taking my mask off when I'm in a crowd of people. And I'm always going to clean my hands because guess what hasn't happened in a year? I have not had a cold. It's wonderful. I'm not, I did not catch the residency plague. Um, and that part is really cool. Uh, so I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> but it was nice to kind of finally be able to feel like we could shift out of that um, previous mindset. Um, so um, that is what I've got for as far as my, my talk. Thank you guys so much for listening to me monologue. <laughs> um, I think now I, I will take some questions and I know that there's some questions in the chat. Um, so maybe um, Sandy or Andrea, yeah. let me know how, how you want us to do the Q&A. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Shirlene. That was amazing. I learned so much. I almost cried at some point. <laughs> it was um, and yes, please, everyone, if you have any questions for Shirlene or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, you can also unmute yourself and ask. Um, I do have a few questions. I have a lot of questions. But there was one in the chat that I do want to draw attention to. It was from Cheryl. And she says, great comics, Shirlene. Do you create these freehand or do you have a favorite e-tool? Um, yeah, so I draw everything on Procreate on my iPad. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, and so just with an Apple Pencil, Procreate is very similar to Photoshop. Um, 
if you're familiar with it. And so I suppose it's freehand because I, I, I do draw everything, um, but um, it is digital. And I do have one question while we wait for folks to kind of get their thoughts together and maybe share some questions in the chat. Um, can you share, like, are there areas of medicine or maybe parts of the culture of medical practice that you haven't yet explored in Shirley World MD, but that you hope to in the future? Oh, definitely. Um, so I think that there are aspects, for example, um, I have a lot of things to say about academic medicine and how it's conducted that I haven't really talked about yet. Um, and um, I think that part of the reason why I haven't is because I'm kind of waiting for the, I, I, I kind of look, wait for inspiration to really kick in um, for the best ways to depict things that are still like, like still allow room for nuance and conversation. Um, and so those kind of things. And as I, as I go on, because I'm going to be a cardiology fellow pretty soon. And so I'm going to be exposed to all sorts of different um, dilemmas <laughs> that I think will provide, will, will act as inspiration. Mm -hmm. I also know that we have several, um, I think, li librarians that work in the medical sciences here with us today. Um, so they might be, they're more experts in this field than I am, but I know that you mentioned graphic medicine. And I was wondering if you could kind of describe that a little bit more. And maybe if you think that the pandemic is gonna shift the way that the field of graphic medicine is going, perhaps to showing more about the, the internal struggles that doctors and residents go through. Exactly. Um, so graphic medicine um, was coined by Ian Williams. Um, and it's really the use of comics to talk about the illness experience and to really talk about um, healthcare. So initially, most of the narratives within graphic medicine were from the perspective of patients or from um, family members of patients. So there are books such as like Mom's Cancer um, that, um, or graphic novels, excuse me, um, that really kind of explore um, what it's like from the patient side or in this particular case, um, a family member um, of a, a, a patient with cancer, right? Um, and who kind of go through that illness experience. But um, as graphic medicine has kind of expanded, I think it's come to include more and more people who interface with medicine. So um, now, I mean, and even with social media, right, there, there's a lot of us. Um, we're a, a small but mighty community of uh, physician artists um, or, and nurse artists. Um, um, who are um, creating uh, and talking about um, our own feelings and narratives and experiences within um, medicine um, through the comic form. Um, I think that it's become a lot more popular in the pandemic. I think people are starting to kind of know, um, to, to be familiar with it. Um, and I wonder whether that's because uh, we've all kind of found reason to like, or feel like we need to um, express ourselves um, in some other way. And so I think that, um, I think it's gonna, probably take off pretty soon. And I think we're gonna start seeing more of it, um, you see use more for not just self-expression, um, but also for education. Um, kind of harkens back to the question that you asked me about where I see myself doing graphic medicine in the future. Um, and I, I definitely wanna use it a little bit more for medical education as well, just like explaining things to patients. Because I think that, I mean, even me, I'm like a physician now and I look back at all my doctor points and I'm like, ooh, like you did not tell me anything. <laughs> um, and so um, just being able to like provide um, like ways to explain these complicated medical like conditions and like plans and prognoses to patients in ways that they can go back and refer to um, is something that I think we're going to see a lot more and that I'm personally um, passionate about. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and I think we just have one question in the chat as well from Corey Knight. Um, and she says, considering how very honest you are about this stuff, meaning like the work-life balance, has there been any blowback from any authority figures on what you create and how you handle it? Um, so, you know, not everybody is always happy with like the messages that I say, but um, uh, I, so I have a bit, my take on it is this, right? And this is gonna sound a little salty, but I, I joke that like I, my, all of my comics are a little salty which is that I think that there's an expectation that we give all of us ourselves to medicine, that you go in and that's, you know, that's, that's why they, like we are, they're able to lean into the whole healthcare workers heroes narrative is that you're supposed to take whoever you are as a person and just give it to medicine, right? Like you have chosen this field. And I push back against that. And I think that, um, Part of the reason why I um, am like, I, I, I want to be able to retain my voice, right? Um, and that I should retain my voice and that um, anyone who has a problem with that probably doesn't deserve my presence. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I deal with it, <laughs> is to be like, oh, tough. <laughs> 
Thank you. And we have time for one more question or comment. And I think Elisa Cortez has her hand up. Elisa, would you like to share? Yeah, I have a question regarding what are some um, ways that we could support graphic medicine and encourage our medical students to, to feel empowered and have a little more, um, like I get a lot of comments, oh, I don't know how to draw. But you know, it's some of times it's just getting out there and trying. Exactly. No. Um, and I hear that a lot too when I do workshops. And I think that what I always give an example of is XKCD. He's not in, in graphic medicine, but um, one of these, like one of the, the biggest like web comic artists who's out there, stick figures. All of his characters are stick figures. You do not need to actually be able to draw to be able to express yourself um, within um, with in, gra in graphic medicine. Um, and I think that is one of the hardest things to do things to jump over is this fear of really sharing. Um, and especially for the medical student type, we're all very type A um, and used to being good at things um, and feel a little bit, are a little worried about sharing something that we're not necessarily quote unquote good at. Um, and so what I usually tell um, people when I do workshop is, workshops is to kind of forget other people um, when you're doing this, uh, pretend that you're doing it just for yourself. Um, if they want more information, there's actually a graphic medicine website and we just started a liaison um, series fairly recently. Um, I My brain is forgetting off the top, but I'll, I'll type it in the chat. Um, it's um, it's like graphicmedicine.org, I think. <laughs> um, that, That's correct. Uh, You're one of our liaisons and thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. <laughs> so exactly. So to, to get more information kind of about it there. Thank you so much, everyone, and Shirley for sharing with us. Um, we're going to take a, a brief break right now, um, and so we can start preparing for our next section of today's event. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, so please, if you're going to be able to stick with us for the next event, we highly encourage you to do so. Uh, please go ahead and gather your materials. We'll just need paper, pens, pencils, any colors that you would like to have, and we'll return back here in just a few minutes, probably closer to three minutes since we are running a little bit over. Thank you so much.
Okay, and we're back. I know that was that was really quick. Those five minutes went by fast. So thanks everyone. Uh, we're really looking forward to starting part two of today's workshop, which is our creative comic making workshop. And I have the honor of now introducing Rachel Cruz, who will be leading this portion of today's event. Rachel Cruz is from Hayward, California. She is the author of God's Will for Monsters, which won an American Book Award in 2018 and the 2016 Hilary Gravendike Regional Poetry Prize. She was appointed the 2018-2020 Inlandia Literary Laureate. Her most recent book, Experiencing Comics, An Introduction to Reading, Discussing, and Creating Comics, was published in fall 2018. She is a lecturer in the Creative Writing Department at the University of California, Riverside. An Emerging Voices Fellow, a Kundiman Fellow, and a Vona Writer, she lives and writes in Southern California. So everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Rachel Cruz. And Rachel, you can take it away from here. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and thank you, um, Andrea, for organizing this event. And thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you, Charlene, for such an incredible presentation. I have learned a lot from that. And I just uh, feel really honored to uh, present alongside you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my, my screen here. So again, my name is Rachel Cruz. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And um, I'm also the author of Experiencing Comics, an introduction to reading, discussing, and creating comics. Um, I've taught comics here at UC Riverside for the past seven years. And something that I've noticed is that there isn't I know, Rachel, I think we might have lost you. Darn Zoom, right? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna turn my video off because my internet has been unstable. It's been kicking me out all day. So um, I have taught comics here at UC Riverside for the past seven years. And, um, and so I created this text as a, an accessible guide for my students. And um, one of the most favorite parts of this, um, that, this text, and I really felt like a curator uh, more than an author because I was able to include over 30 cartoonists, creators, and com comic scholars who are currently working in the field. Um, many of these folks are, are um, web cartoonists, um, they're academics, so there's a, a huge range of uh, folks that I was able to interview and, and these people were also able to offer exercises, um, share advice to um, versioning cartoonists, and so it's for me, um, a space where my hope is that students can find some semblance of their experiences um, through this text. So we're going to make comics today, and um, you know, and typically I teach creative writing students, and this is the first thing that I hear is that I can't draw, and um, and I say I hear you. <laughs> you know, um, typically it's the stick figures that people rely on. Um, and I want to credit Nick Susanas, who's this amazing comics academic out of San Francisco State University, um, who talks about the fact that drawing just has to do with clarity. And if you are drawing a clear line or a clear image, then it will have an emotional impact on your audience. And I like to think of um, Ali Brosh who is the author of Hyperbole and a Half. Uh, she started out as a, a web cartoonist and her comics were eventually published in, a, in printed form. Um, but her comics are so expressive and she was able to create them through MS Paint. And they're very simple and iconic, um, but very complex. You know, she's uh, sharing stories about her own depression. She's talking about her childhood a really huge range of um, experiences. And she's able to do this through really simplified um, drawing. So go ahead and take out a sheet of paper. Um, we're gonna need a couple of sheets of paper today. And um, I'd like for you to draw a happy line. And I'm just gonna give you like 20 seconds to do this. So not too long. I don't want you to overthink it. 
draw a happy line. And whenever you're ready, I'd like for someone to volunteer and we can spotlight your video um, here on Zoom and we can hold up our happy lines. If you want, if you don't want to show your face, totally understandable. But if you want to show your happy lines, feel free to do so. Okay, so starting now. Okay, that was like 10 seconds, way too long. So go ahead and stop. And um, I'm going to stop my shared screen just to see if anyone would like to share their happy line. Or in the chat, you can kind of describe what it looks like if you don't have um, video access. Okay, I see Rob. Okay, can I, Rob, is it okay if I, um, okay, I'm going to spotlight you. You uh, can hold that hard. up. Could you I describe your happy line? Well, it's supposed to be a smile and eyes, but I don't know if it's a smile or it looks like an uncertain smile now that I think about it. <laughs> okay, great. So we have two circles. We kind of have, you know, this wavy line. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Shirlene, I think I see you. I'm going to add you to the spotlight. Okay. Ooh, okay. Shirlene, could you describe your happy... It looks like me and Rob drew very similar happy lines. It's kind of, uh, we, we both gave it a little twirl somewhere. It's it, like, like yours also, I kind of went for the whole same, like maybe a smiley face thing too. Um, yeah. But, um, it, yeah, mine also looks kind of goofy slash uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Did anyone else draw kind of like a wavy, curvy um, line? Okay, I see some head nods, right? So again, even if we don't know how to draw, right, technically, or maybe you're not trained, we do get a sense of what happiness feels like on the page, right? So next, we're going to go ahead and draw an angry line. Okay, go ahead and stop. And are there any volunteers who would like to share theirs or uh, describe it in the chat? Okay, Rob, I see you. I'm going to spotlight you. Ooh, okay. So we got some pointy, yeah, okay. Hayden in the chat has something very similar. Sandy has something <laughs> super pointy, yep. Yep, I think lots it's of sharp, pretty dark universal, people. big, sharp, angry teeth. Or <laughs> yeah, like fantastic. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people have really similar um, shapes for their for their angry lines. Oh, someone has kind of a Charlie Brown line too. That's great. Okay, how about a focused line? Take a couple seconds for a focused line. Okay, go ahead and stop. I think I see Anna holding up. Anna, is that your notebook? If you'd like to share. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I will put you on the spot. You see, you're holding it up. Okay. Ooh, okay. We have we have an arrow pointing um, towards a line, a horizontal line. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Rob. Okay, someone else has um, something straight across. Yeah, Sandy has it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so this little one at the bottom, it's just very small, but also it's an arrow. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so it looks like um, what people are drawing are, are lines kind of coming to a focus, right, to a point, right? That's great. How about a strong line? Oh, and Ariel has a, has a tight, tight spiral for a focus line. I've actually done that as well where it's still but it's still coming to a point right which is interesting okay any volunteers for a strong line
Ooh, okay. I see, I see Anna. Oh, interesting. Okay, so we have um, some vertical horizontal lines, kind of like they sort of look like building blocks. That's yeah, that's something like blocks. Yeah, exactly. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Sandy, I'm gonna go ahead and replace the spotlight here. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we have um, two lines coming to a point. Yeah, exactly, kind of like a, uh, it's hard to see, like a mountain almost, like that's what I think of as strength, but like a triangle that's not finished, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so this one is gonna be a little bit more interesting. How about a self-portrait line? And it could be a self-portrait line of how you're feeling right now. And what we'll do is we'll have, um, we'll draw these and then um, you're not drawing like a face like yourself, but you're drawing a line that represents where you're at right now. Okay, so just take a couple seconds for that. Okay, so go ahead and stop. And I'd like two volunteers, one volunteer to share their self-portrait line, and then another volunteer to interpret that self-portrait line. Feel free to raise your hand in the reactions button, or I'm kind of scrolling through all the participants. So if you're interested, you could just physically raise your hand and I can call on you. Okay, Rob. If I'm appearing too much, I apologize, but. No, this is great. <laughs> okay. How about, so, um, uh, can you show us which one's your. your um, it's, uh, let me see, that, that one. Okay. All right, I'm spotlighting you. And mm. uh, Anna, would you like to interpret Rob's self-portrait line? It's the one in the middle. Yeah. Uh, I guess he's maybe feeling like doing something extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> shall I, shall it, I let the yeah. shall I let the cat out of the bag? <laughs> well, um, should, um, lot to think about. Uh, not what I was thinking, but mainly it's this this line here. The kind of I mean, from for me, that was more a feeling of being comfortable. Mm. But I don't know if anyone, uh, if anybody uh, else saw that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah, okay. So Danielle says curled up like a cat. Yeah, kind of, you know, being with oneself and and feeling, yeah, kind of that. I was thinking internal reflection almost. Mm. Okay, Sandy says I was thinking. Uh, going out of your comfort zone since it stopped the cycle. Like a snail shell. Yeah, it reminds me of snail shell. Maybe comfortable, maybe lazy. Okay, I like that interpretation. Interpretation spirally <laughs> to a platform of comfort. That's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Rob. Welcome, thanks. Um, would anyone else like to share their, their self-portrait line and, and see if anyone wants to volunteer to interpret? I can share mine. But, okay. but that's that's pretty easy to 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 <laughs> find this out about my play. Okay, we got we got like a time too as a is that part of it, Anna? The time eleven twenty one p.m. Yeah, the time and okay, this, okay. This this thing under the time. Okay, the thing under the time. Would anyone like to interpret? And again, feel free to uh, interpret in the chat as well. Sorry, Anna, do you mind holding it up a little bit longer so people can take, yeah, thank you. Okay, Rob says disorganized. Megaphone or computer, Elisa says.
Muted, ooh, silence. Yeah, silenced. Okay, that's coming up a few times. What do you think, Anna? Any of these um, in the ballpark? Uh, yeah, this the silence because it's nighttime. So, <laughs> um, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so, my whole point about this exercise is that you may not be a wonderful visual artist like Charlene <laughs> or have the skills to work on, you know, a tablet, um, but we can all use visual communication to um, showcase um, emotion and expression, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen again. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what it's been like teaching comics during the um, during COVID, and then we'll do another um, exercise. So I like that um, Sandy and Andrea they both had a a slide during the break that referenced uh, Malika Garib's comic on COVID, and this was actually one of the first comics that I saw about COVID. I think it came out in February or early March of 2020. And during that time, I was teaching um, my introduction to graphic novels course here at UCR, and it was widely circulated. And, um, and as was earlier mentioned, um, comics are, are such a, um, an accessible way to distribute information um, to audiences and to um, be, feel invited to an experience, right? And so Malika creates this really colorful, um, easily um, easily accessible comic in learning about the facts about COVID, how to wash your hands for 20 seconds. This is on the left-hand side. And I, and I had talked and shared this comic with my students. And at this point, it's funny, in March 2020, they were already tired of hearing about COVID, right? So when I shared this with them, they were kind of rolling their eyes. And this is, of course, before all the lockdowns. Um, but this was um, a comic that for my students, they could see it as something that was informational. Um, and they were thinking also about, we were talking about comics as nonfiction as well, right? A lot of uh, the comics that I teach um, are from a fiction tradition. Um, and so these were one of the um, examples that we we're seeing how comics sort of gained um, traction during this time uh, to express and share a message. So during this time, I've, I've seen comics used as a way to process um, social distancing, um, the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on black and brown communities and the current Black Lives Matter global revolution. Um, I've also seen it as a means of creating community and connection with distant strangers and friends. Um, one of the events I was able to help organize um, in May through the Digital Sala, which is a, a virtual literary festival, um, was this event with Malika Gareb, who, um, incredible cartoonist, um, she's Philippinex and Egyptian. And we did this fun recipe exchange through comics and we were able to gather uh, 75 uh, Filipino folks throughout the diaspora globally to share just their favorite recipes. Because in a, in a time of social distancing, um, it felt like we couldn't break bread, we couldn't eat with our communities, and this was just the next best, best thing. And after the workshop, people were able to send their recipes as postcards to one another. So there are these tangible comics that people uh, were getting sent to their homes and that they were sending to others. Um, I've seen zines start to populate Instagram and other uh, social media platforms. Um, and we're gonna actually make a zine in a little bit. And I've also seen the proliferation of comics workshops for free um, through places like the Believer magazine. And so I'd highly recommend um, the Believer. They're still going on, they're on a weekly basis. And these are comics workshops that are oriented around a particular theme, um, like this one by uh, Teresa Wong, Draw Your Lockdown Life, um, self-care comics. Um, comics journaling. And they're really a way to, again, process um, this time 
and to also just to make art, you know, um, and I think that art is healing. One of my favorite cartoonists, Linda Berry, says that art is like the immune system for the soul. And I think that's so true, you know, in my experience as, as both the, as an artist and as a writer. So we're gonna make a zine. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with zines, but they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, they're really portable, they're cheap and easy to make. Um, the reason why I make them and that I make them with my students is that it's low stakes. Um, you don't need to know how to draw in order to make one. They sort of have their origins in like the DIY or do it yourself like punk era in the 80s um, and 90s. And, and they're just a whole lot of fun. You know, they're handmade, which makes it really important to do, especially since we're in front of screens all the time. Um, and it's experiential. So um, when I'm working with students, it allows students to get gain some insight to a cartoonist decision making. And so it's, it's a really great way to um, have that, you know, hands on experience. So these are just some examples of zines and we're gonna make a zine together. And I'm gonna try to turn my camera on. Hopefully my Zoom doesn't crash as we do this. Um, but if you haven't already, go ahead and take out a sheet of paper and you're gonna fold it in half. And I'm gonna follow, you're just gonna follow the diagram here on the screen and it's gonna be read left to right and then down um, to the second half of the in, of the screen and left to right. So you're going to fold it in half, your sheet of paper. And if you don't have scissors, you can, you know, crease it with your fingernails. So um, fold it in half like a hamburger, <laughs> as they say in elementary school. Um, and you're going to open it up. And then um, you're gonna take, sorry, my, my Zoom background is kind of being, sorting the image here. So you're gonna go ahead and take um, one end of the sheet of paper and then fold it towards the crease. So we're right here in this um, step two. So you're gonna fold towards the crease. And again, use your fingernails. Um, to create some strong creases. So you should have like four um, panels or four sections. Let me see mine. And then you're gonna, um, so if you're gonna open it up and you have one, two, three, four, again, we're here in the middle, we're gonna move to this third image right here. You're gonna fold it down and then you're gonna have eight panels or eight boxes once you fold it. Okay. And again, I'm emphasizing um, just strong creases so it'll be easier to tear in case you don't have any scissors. So I'm opening it up and I have eight boxes or eight panels or right here, this, this third image. And let me know if you have any questions. And now we're gonna to move to um, this bottom left image. And this is the tricky part, okay? So um, I really wanna to emphasize to pay attention as we do this part. So you're gonna have a folded side and an open side, right? A folded side and an open side, right? So if you fold your paper in half, you're gonna cut just one part of the crease on the folded side. And you can even rip it. So 
it's gonna let me turn off my um virtual background so you can see this okay that's better so it's gonna open up like this so here's your the open side this is the folded side right Okay, and now you're going to open it up and here's the tricky part. This is where everyone gets confused. So here is my paper. It has a cut in the middle. Right, so you're going to pinch these two creases and you're going to fold it like this and it's going to be a book. Okay, yay, Sandy has hers. And I can do it again. Okay, yay, Rob has his. So Anna, you're gonna go ahead and open it up like this. You're gonna pinch the creases on either side of the slit. And then you're gonna meet these two creases together like that. Yep, you got it, Annie. You're almost there. Yep, and then you're just gonna fold it together. Yep. You're almost there. So you have to force it a little bit. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> so here's your. Here's I'm your afraid to. I'm afraid to. I don't know. Is this right? You got it. You got it. So you're gonna have to push it together. You got it. Mm. <laughs> I'm afraid to actually. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> it's just, no. If it's not working. You might need to recrease. You might need to go ahead and recrease it. Kind of go through the folds using your fingernails. Kind of um, make make the folds a little bit um, more creased. Yeah. I know it's it, it's tough. It's sort of like a brain puzzle, especially over Zoom, right? It's sort of hard with these spatial things. Is Yay, this, okay, is this yeah. way, right? Yep. Keep going. So you're gonna have or should like, I keep it from this way, from this side? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Here, let me see. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you. Is that okay? That way I can help you. Stop my shared. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So this way. Okay, so open it up again. Open up the sheet of paper. Okay. So here's I'm gonna mirror you. And then you're gonna you're gonna hold, you're gonna flip your paper like this. Mm -hmm. Other side, vertical. This way. Yep. Okay. And then pinch your creases. So here's your slit. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna push it inwards. Yay! You got it. Now. Ah, okay. It I got Maybe. it from the other side. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Sorry. You got it. Yeah, no. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so you just made a zine. And now we're gonna fill this zine with um, some images and we're gonna reflect on, um, you know, this will be sort of like reflecting on the past year in, in, a, in a zine capsule, right? So each of these prompts that I give you uh, can really be um, their own zine, but for the purpose of, purposes of today, we're just gonna kind of summarize and share key points um, as we're making this zine. So here's the cover. I'm not gonna show you my cover yet. So you're gonna open it up to pages two and three. And feel free to answer these prompts. Um, the first prompt is who, who I was in March, 2020. Um, you can include sentences on what normal um, or a typical day for you was in March, 2020. Um, so for example, this is um, an image from pages two and three from my zine. So in March, 2020, before COVID-19, I was honk. 
driving constantly to both jobs and emailing students about their concerns regarding COVID. So to my student, still meeting in person, we should be okay, I think. Okay. So um, again, simple lines, shapes, um, doesn't have to be perfect. Um, the purposes of this is just to reflect on our experiences. So just to take, uh, take a couple minutes to work on this. And then if you are done, feel free to let us know in the chat. Just take another minute and don't worry if you're not finished because we can always come back and um, add additional flourishes or details later. Okay, so we're gonna to move to the next two pages, which are uh, pages four and five. Um, so in my zine, um, I wrote down how I coped and survived in the early days of the pandemic. And you can include sentences on the habits you've formed, things, people that you've lost or gained, et cetera. And so from my zine, um, I wrote down, when the world shut down, I coped by walking every day and cooking Filipino stews.
you just take another minute and then we again we can always come back to these sections later on Okay, and for pages six and seven, um, what I learned about myself, my family, and the world at this time. And you can pick any configuration of this prompt to answer. So um, my page six and seven um, are, I was enraged, but also learned to detach from anti-maskers. Um, I also learned how to be true to myself and create healthy boundaries. Okay, just take another minute. And on the back cover, feel free to write down um, ideas about who you are today. So you can answer some of these questions if you'd like. What does quote unquote normal mean to you now? Uh, what do you want to leave behind? And what does the future hold? 
Um, you don't have to answer all these questions. These are just prompts to get you thinking about um, this current moment. So um, on my back cover, I wrote, as of today, May 2021, I'm fully vaccinated and have more hope than ever. Thank you, science. We'll just take a few minutes to work on that back cover. Can you just take another minute? Okay, and now you're going to go ahead and flip to the cover and pick an iconic image that encapsulates 2020. So here we got a dumpster fire uh, in the year 2020. Uh, so feel free to um, pick any image that you'd like um, and include the year if you'd like as well. And if you're done, feel free to add some color or go back to the earlier pages you didn't finish. Uh, feel free to sketch in more detail if you'd like.
take another minute. And go ahead and just finish up your, your last thought. It's okay if it's not done. You can always go back and um, add more color if you'd like. Um, but at this time, I'd like to open it up for anyone who wants to share their zine um, or if anyone wants to read a line or add a line in the chat. I'm gonna stop my shared screen here so we can look at each other awkwardly <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully share our zines. Um, and really we to go through each page or just one of the <laughs> panels. Totally up to you, Elisa. Um, if you want to share just, uh, your cover and then maybe, uh, a few of your pages, that'd be great. So I'll get the, the ball rolling. I don't know if you can see. So I put in um, a laptop with, um, heavy doses of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and then I put some sparks coming out of it because a lot of the connections came from that laptop, both uh, social and just work. And so I thought that would be a good cover. And then for the first page, I just remember a very distinct visit to Costco. And I put a little um, thought bubble of me thinking, hmm, maybe and trying to decide whether I needed to add something to my cart. Like I had been hearing about the pandemic starting in China and things, but we hadn't been told anything. And it was um, March 1st, I had done my monthly Costco run and it was, it's just this weird feeling that just kind of came over me. And so I remember buying a little extra water and toilet paper, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So awesome. I thought I'd get this, these two panels just um, to get the thoughts going for everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I love that you had a car and the and the speech bubble there. That's great. I love that you used the elements of comics to incorporate that in your zine. <laughs> awesome. Would anyone else like to share? You don't have to share the whole thing if you don't like. Or feel free to share what this experience was like, just making a zine um, in the chat. <clears throat> or you can unmute. I can share mine um, just to get the ball line too. My cover, it might be hard to recognize, but it's the little burning. If anyone remembers a little dog in the burning room, that just that image was just for 2020 in a nutshell for me. And then um, for my first page, I still need to do the second side, but I put in March 2020, I was freshly new to UCR and learning the ropes. I, I would only have been on campus for six months. So this is my little drawing of Rivera Library, but it's like the little arches, distinctive arches, because it's just that's that's like the only corner of UCR that I was like familiar with and, and knew about. But yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Sandy. Yeah, I love that meme of the the, the dog who's like, this is fine, <laughs> right? It clearly is not. Thank you. If you like, I could share mine. Sure. Okay, okay. So, well, uh, I think I've come through pretty unscathed, but it wasn't, in retrospect, it wasn't the easiest of years. I had a couple of health issues and uh, of course, you know, not being able to get to the gym exacerbated that. So pre-COVID, like BC, before COVID, it was a uh, case of, you know, driving from home to work and back again. Uh, I, I've left a lot of stuff out. It's not just working. It's not just work and home, but there's a lot of other stuff as well. But then all of a sudden, no gym. Uh, mm. I'm, a, I'm a freelance teacher. So for me, 
a lot yeah, at the beginning especially a lot of my jobs just uh, like left and i had like so much more even now i'm not at full capacity so time is up but then again energy went down i i, I hope i'm not bringing you all down with this you know? okay and uh then the next bit with the prompt what i learned about myself hang on a sec i can't really because i trying to see myself and go. what I learned about myself. Yeah, whoops, there you go. Buying extra nibbles, buying extra snacks <laughs> is not a great idea. Getting up only when I need to leads to later and later nights. And then uh, la, 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 the back page, focus, focus. Sure, uh, focus. There you go. Who am I today? I am more. Approximately five kilograms more, actually. I don't know what that <laughs> is in pounds. Uh, and willpower don't come easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's but fantastic. It's Thank you so much, Rob. I love <laughs> that you drew hands because those are notoriously difficult to draw. So those are that was wonderful. Thank you. I think I saw Danielle um, hold up. I think I saw you hold up your, your zine if you'd like to share, please. Let me see if I can spotlight you. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the library, so wearing my mask. Um, let's see. Here's my cover. That's the bug that we all see. Then March, wasn't too bad. Let's see, I was getting worried. I started sewing and then March 13th in LA, that was the lockdown. Then um, well, I started making some new habits I cried a little bit. I found yeast. Then we started doing pizza night every Friday night. And um, let's see. Oh, I, I walked the neighborhood a lot. I took up some some new things, uh, gardening, and made some beverages at home. We got a new cat. It was okay. I, I cried some. Oop, other side. But I learned to slow down, enjoy small things like sunshine, bike rides. I still had to come to work every day because I work at a hospital library. So, but everybody else here did too. So we had each other. Gotcha, girl. That, that's a fist bump, not a hug or anything. <laughs> but that, that's my light at the end of the tunnel. We have some hope. And pizza night won't change though. <laughs> I've come to enjoy that a lot. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Danielle. <laughs> These are so great. Um, and I think that's about all the time we have for and I, I just appreciate everyone um, being so generous and sharing their experiences. And they're all relatable. And I think this has just been a time of trauma, but art really helps truly to heal um, and to process experiences we've gone through. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I don't think we have time for questions. I am happy to stick around for a few minutes if people do have questions or email me, but I'm going to turn it over back to um, Andrea and Sandy. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Rachel. Oh, I'll let you take it over, Andrea. I'll just pull the screen. Yeah. I was going to say thank you so much, Rachel. Um, it was so interesting to follow along as everyone created their zines um, and get guidance and um, direction from somebody with such wonderful expertise. So I just wanted to take a quick se second to invite you to send us your zines um, so that I can archive them as part of our COVID-19 collecting initiative that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can do this by sharing them also on social media. 
Um, if you want to take a photo of your um, zine, um, you can uh, then post it on Twitter and tag us at UCR Archives, or you can send them um, to me via email, and my email address is on screen there. Um, so if you want to take a photo, um, uh, please feel free to send it to me via email. Um, or finally, if you want to actually send in the zine um, to the library, um, we would love to have a copy of it. Um, and the address is uh, there on your screen as well. And before we go, I want to take a picture of everyone with their comic. So if you'd like to participate, um, that would be great. Um, but if you do not want to be a part of the picture, please turn off your camera now. Um, and if you'd like to leave, this is the last thing we're going to do. So if you don't want to be a part of the photo, um, you can feel free to go. Um, and everyone who does want to be a part of the photo, um, if you turn your camera on um, and hold up your comic, um, I'll give everyone a few seconds to get ready and then I'll come to three and we'll take the picture. <laughs> 